Most kids love dinosaurs, even enough to have dinosaur-themed birthday parties. There's just something fascinating about the idea that somewhere or some when there lived a ferocious group of reptiles romping around. But we should understand that ideas can have serious consequences on the worldview of our children. The world certainly does, and they take advantage of it. Once upon this same earth, beneath this same sun, long before you, before the ape and the elephant as well, before the wolf, the bison, the whale, before the mammoth and the mastodon, in the time of the dinosaurs. So started the introduction to The Land Before Time, the very popular 1988 animated children's movie that featured a cast of cute juvenile dinosaurs led by Littlefoot, an adolescent brontosaurus, who venture out on a long journey and must overcome several obstacles and challenges, including the vicious sharp tooth, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. You've probably seen it. It became quite popular and spawned a whole series of interconnected movies, TV series, video games, soundtracks, and all sorts of toys, t-shirts, and other merchandising. And like most depictions of dinosaurs for children, it captured then, and still does now, the imaginations of many young minds and promotes and reinforces popular evolutionary concepts like deep time and progression of life. From its opening sequence, it begins as the authoritative sounding narrator says, same earth, but long before you, which of course establishes the concept of long ages. The next creature it mentioned, well, before the ape, which reinforces the ape to man concept. Then it mentions a group of other mammals and then inserts dinosaurs before that, which reinforces the concept of progression of life. It was as if the so-called scientific textbook that I'd perused as a child had somehow been animated into a simple plot line. This classic evolutionary portrait of dinosaurs is exactly what I had been taught in our state schools here in Canada, long before this series of movies appeared. The books I read as a kid had pictures pretty much like this one, depicting a group of dinosaurs sitting in the backdrop of an exotic tropical forest with a volcano spewing lava in the background. And as usual, there were various flying reptiles hovering around, but there would almost never be any mammals in sight. I was enraptured with this idea of there being a world long ago where dinosaurs ruled the earth. Little did I realize how this would later shape my metaphysical outlook on life or the theological implications of accepting a story where a creator was not required. I just dove into the rabbit hole of evolutionary thought full on wanting to discover what the experts had discovered about the past. As my reading material became more sophisticated, I repeatedly came across charts showing the geologic column, displaying the supposed order and timing of when Earth's life form appeared all within that framework of the so-called ages of Earth's geologic history. Primitive and simple organisms were shown at the bottom, and more complex ones were towards the top. The pictures were arranged in a general sequence with marine animals first, amphibians next, then reptiles, then dinosaurs appearing, then small mammals, larger mammals like bears and horses, then apes, and finally humans at the top. And contrary to the reasoning of my Christian friends who use the popular canard that, well, Genesis doesn't have to be taken as plainly written because God only wrote it that way for the Israelites who were too simple to comprehend the scientific sophistication of evolution, this was all very easy for the average child like myself to grasp. If God had used evolution to create, it would have been very easy for him to convey. Imagine the following. Long ago, before there was man, God created the first living thing, and that first thing slowly changed, and its descendants changed, and eventually they turned into every living thing that has ever lived on earth. And eventually came mankind. First Evolutionians, Chapter 1, Made Up Version. You see, explaining the idea of evolution in Genesis would have been extremely easy to do should God have wanted to do so. The fact is, he didn't. 
Compromising the plain reading in one area of scripture in Genesis, and then telling people they should take another area as plainly written, like the Gospels, it's arbitrary, it's illogical, and it's inconsistent. Far from cerebral, it seems like special pleading and mentally incohesive. And for linear thinking individuals like myself, it provides little intellectual satisfaction whatsoever. However, for me growing up, books showing cool pictures of scientists digging up dinosaur bones, collecting fossils, holding them in their hands, and explaining how they would have moved ergonomically, it fired my imagination. There were charts and graphs and dates, and it all seemed so logical and scientific, which was pretty much unlike any religious TV programming I saw, which with my family background was my only introduction to anything church-related. This idea that the fossil record was tidy and that this fossil lineage was always found this way with no out-of-place fossils was strong evidence for evolution in my mind. It was also crystal clear, just like how famous atheist Richard Dawkins had put it, all the fossils that we have ever found have always been found in the appropriate place in the time sequence. There are no fossils in the wrong place. For many, just like myself, breaking these paradigms is important for them to be willing to even entertain a biblical worldview. Most people think that the remains of dinosaurian creatures always appear in the older parts of the fossil record, while mammalian types appear in younger rocks with supposedly millions of years of time separating the various animal groups shown on the charts you see. Many conclude that mammals and dinosaurs never coexisted, or if they did, it was only for a short overlapping period where small shrew-like mammals first evolved. However, the facts show otherwise, and more and more evidence is discovered that is consistent with what we would know from the Bible. Namely, that there was a gigantic catastrophe in the form of a watery deluge, Noah's flood, that destroyed and likely buried representatives of many of the kinds of creatures that were living together, dinosaurs among them, all at the same time. As Carl Werner pointed out with the release of his 2012 book, Living Fossils, Evolution, The Grand Experiment, Volume 2, at that time, over 432 mammal species had already been identified in dinosaur-era rock, including nearly 100 complete mammal skeletons. He also points out that despite this, in his travel to over 60 museums around the world, he'd only seen a few dozen of these featured in displays, and not one displaying a complete skeleton. However, as the evidence piled up, even popular level science articles began showing the often disharmonious nature, according to evolution, of the fossil record. I'm a big believer in what's known as farmer logic. It's the type of common sense that declares if something looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and acts like a duck, it's probably a duck. But when a supposedly 110 million year old creature called Gansus was found years ago, one of the reporters commenting on it in a New York Times article titled, Duck Lookalike Reveals Bird's Evolution, said, it looked like a duck, it swam like a duck, it's not known if it quacked like a duck, but it definitely was not a duck. Now, <laughs> why was it not considered a duck even though the article said it looked remarkably like a modern day waterfowl? Well, likely it was largely because it didn't fit the evolutionary timeline. But this isn't the only time evolutionists have admitted duck-like creatures lived alongside dinosaurs. A 2006 National Geographic article commenting on this discovery titled Dinosaur Era Birds Surprisingly Duck-Like, Fossil Suggests, by the way, now removed from the internet, said, Gansas shares many skeletal features with modern birds knobby knees, characteristic of underwater swimmers like loons. The preserved skin of the webbed feet show the same microscopic structure seen in aquatic birds today. Also, a BBC article titled Cretaceous Duck Ruffles Feathers discussed and featured a picture of a duck-billed type dinosaur on a beach with two birds that looked like geese and had a subtitle that said Ducks may have been paddling about in primeval swamps when T. rex was king of the dinosaurs, scientists have announced in the journal Nature. Let's face it, 
<laughs> when is the last time you saw a depiction of dinosaurs stomping around, snarling at one another as a duck flew overhead? See, it would seem strange to most because we've been conditioned to view dinosaurs as living quite separately from modern animal kinds, which reinforces the whole land before time paradigm. Most people have been told dinosaurs evolved into birds, so they don't expect a picture of a T-Rex walking along with ducks flying around. But that's what the fossils evolutionists have found show. Dinosaurs and birds lived contemporaneously. You see, while the average person believes in an age of dinosaurs, modern evolutionary paleontologists have admitted the following. In a sense, the age of dinosaurs is a misnomer. Mammals are just one such important group that lived with the dinosaurs, coexisted with the dinosaurs, and survived the dinosaurs. But wait, there's more. Picture, if you will, uh, turning on an evolutionary program that showed dinosaurs wandering around a pine forest, along with bees buzzing, squirrels running around, frogs, platypus, and beavers playing in a pond, while a badger hunted and ate a baby Psittacosaurus nearby. Does that fit with how you've seen dinosaurs depicted? Most people are surprised to hear that evolutionists have reported all of those mammals having been found in rock layers they perceive as being dinosaur era, wondering why they've never heard it before. Here's one explanation from a modern evolutionist from Dr. Werner's book mentioned previously. We find mammals in almost all of our dinosaur dig sites. These were not noticed years ago. We have about 20,000 pounds of bentonite clay that has mammal fossils that we're trying to give away to some researcher. It's not that they're not important, it's just that you only live once and I specialized in something other than mammals. I specialize in reptiles and dinosaurs. That's interesting, isn't it? One wonders how many more fossil mammals in dinosaur era rock are still ignored or considered less important than their dinosaur counterparts. The fact is, there's a great likelihood of finding even more representatives of the same kind as modern day mammals in fossil layers all around the world. As one evolutionist, Dr. John Weibel, former mammal curator at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, admitted after finding the remains of what he considered a supposedly 53 million year old rabbit, I would not be surprised if I went out into the field tomorrow and I found a Cretaceous rabbit that was 80 million years old. Wouldn't it be fantastic to see a next generation of Bible-believing scientists that had the right worldview lenses on, that would get out into the field and show even more of what's buried together in the fossil record to demonstrate the truth of God's Word? Having presented on this previously, I once had an evolutionist write to me to complain that I was misrepresenting what had been reported. His argument was that I referenced a beaver, for example, that wasn't a true modern beaver, and that what I called a badger was actually a Repinomammus robustus. And all of these extinct orders are said to have died out tens of millions of years ago with no modern representatives. So he believed it was dishonest to say that it has been proven that dinosaurs walked alongside modern mammals and birds. When I asked him if he would be contacting National Geographic, ABC News, Nature Journals, the BBC or Science Magazine, etc., to inform them that they were wrong for using titles like Jurassic Beaver Swims Into View, Fossils Suggest Platypus Lived in Dinosaur Times, or Cretaceous Duck Ruffles Feathers, he never got back to me. The fact is, biblical creationists don't believe that what was buried with dinosaurs are modern versions of these creatures either. We believe they were earlier variations of the representative kinds of creatures – beavers, waterfowl, platypus, etc. – that existed before the speciation that occurred since the dispersion of the creatures that got off the ark and later spread around the world. Obviously, tigers and tabby cats don't look the same, and if you found them fossilized having never seen them alive, scientists may conclude that they were perhaps related but not the same kind. But all of our modern house cats have been bred from bigger cats in the past and are the same kind of animal. So we don't believe Great Danes got off the ark, nor do we think polar bears or poodles and Persian kitty cats sauntered off the gangplank. We do believe that representative dog, 
bear and cat kinds got off the ark along with all of the other kinds, including the dinosaurs. We also believe that after they departed, they multiplied and diversified through mechanisms like natural selection, which is an inbuilt mechanism that allows creatures to utilize different combinations of pre-existing genetic information to adapt to new environments. The takeaway point is this. The more we dig, the more we find that billions of dead things were living together and got buried together simultaneously over a very short time not millions of years. This adds even more support to the biblical creation model, such as the fact that there are carvings, pictographs, and engravings of creatures a typical seven-year-old would identify as dinosaurs found from cultures dating long before books showing their reconstruction from fossils around the world. Why would they exist if no human had ever seen a live dinosaur? Another question of an evolutionary worldview would be, if there was a land before time, how come unfossilized soft tissue has been found several times now if dinosaurs are supposed to have lived 60 million years ago? The fact that we now know from the fossil record that many creatures were living alongside dinosaurs undermines many popular evolutionary icons. For example, if you asked the average person to guess what wiped out the dinosaurs, I venture that most would say, well, the giant asteroid theory, as even though there are several dinosaur extinction models out there and some evolutionists argue against the asteroid impact idea, it's still the most commonly depicted in popular culture. But if all these creatures were living together, why would an asteroid impact event only wipe out the dinosaurs and not the ducks, squirrels, and beaver kinds, etc., that coexisted with them? not to mention their supposed evolutionary close cousins like the lizards and crocodiles. Not one single event has ever been proposed by evolutionists that can completely explain dinosaur extinction, which is why there are several more extinction theories out there than the average person is usually aware of. Of course, most biblical creationists believe that any dinosaurs living at the time of Noah's flood, but not on board the ark, died and that many were buried in the deluge. That explains the fossils, but what happened to them after the flood? Well, the Bible says the various kinds of animals preserved on the ark dispersed from one central point on the mountains of Ararat, and with their numbers greatly reduced following the flood, all animals would have been subject to many environmental pressures and varying climates and would have been more vulnerable to extinction. Some may have had a unique physiology that made them less able to adapt as rapidly to the many different environments after the flood. For example, evolutionists have suggested that dinosaurs may not have been warm-blooded or cold-blooded, but something completely different from either. They may have had a unique type of metabolism, unlike any living animals today. For those looking for a unique or specific reason, one could conjecture that perhaps this may have contributed to them becoming extinct quicker than some of the other animals but ultimately they likely perished for the same general reasons animals become extinct today. Genetic load, being hunted, diseases, habitat changes, climate changes, etc. When you put all of the evidence together, there's no huge mystery about the existence and extinction of dinosaurs when viewed from the perspective of God's word. Despite the evolutionary community's insistence, there was no land before time. God created time, space and matter together in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We can know exactly how God created when we start with his word. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Exodus 20 verse 11. And we can learn how to better live by faith when we trust it with all of our hearts. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Hebrews 11 verse 7. God made dinosaurs, along with the rest of his creation, around 6,000 years ago. We find their fossilized bones alongside those of other animals because of Noah's flood around 4,500 years ago. They lived after the flood, but gradually died out like so many other species have. When we start with the Bible and then look around the world at the evidence, 
The scripture provides a far better explanation of it than the evolutionary story does. It's actually quite easy to explain dinosaurs in a Christian worldview.